just in a way of review, looking about um, where we've been, at least in this book. I know that we did, the, or y'all, I wasn't in here uh, for the book previous to this, but it was Genesis up to this point, time of Joshua. But from Joshua, the things that we learned as we went through that book is, is the conquest, the conquering of the promised land of Canaan, and then the allotment of that land, and the giving of that land, and those types of things. And then we get into Judges, and again, that's where we are now. We've been through Judges 1 through 12, and really what we see over and over again is a cycle. And I know that you all have seen this chart as we've been going through this class, uh, but just throwing it up there so we uh, have this uh, reminder in our mind of, of the cycle that we continue to see throughout Judges. It starts with the people fall into sin and idolatry, this anger is God, and then there's oppression from an enemy that is sent. The people then cry out or repent. Uh, and then God uh, sends a judge, chooses a judge, and there's salvation through them. There's peace. The judge dies, and then we see this cycle really start over again. And so as they are in this land, one of the things that we recognize and realize is those that were left, uh, as we'll get into in this lesson, the Philistines, but also the others, as you've been seeing, uh, that were left and weren't completely done away with, they continue to be this thorn in the side of, of, of the people, and God uses them uh, as those to oppress them. That brings us uh, to this text, okay, 13 through 16. Again, an overview of it. I'd just like to do this because it's what it is. We have an overview of the Old Testament, and I'll be able to hit on everything that's here, but this is certainly going to guide our lesson this morning. Judges 13, we're going to see an angel of the Lord that visits Manoah and his wife. We get to Judges 14. And we uh, have Samson, who marries a Philistine woman, and, and he has a riddle. We're going to look at that. We'll get to Judges 15. Um, Samson is, is, is angry, um, and we're going to see why that is. But as a result of that, he burns a grain field, and then ultimately he's going to end up killing 1,000 Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. Get into Judges 16. Samson destroys a temple full of Philistines, killing himself in the process. A text, if you will, for this section. Um, you know, we're going to look at Samson. We're going to see a lot of bad and poor choices that he made throughout his life. But at the very end of his life, this is what you really conclude with. Samson saying this prayer as he's in that temple filled with uh, Philistines. And again, we'll get to this when we get to <laughs> Judges 16. But Samson says this prayer, O Lord God, remember me, I pray, strengthen me, I pray just this once, O God, that I may with, uh, with one blow, take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. Well, we're going to see a lot of uh, poor choices that Samson makes throughout his life, bad decisions that he makes throughout his life. One of the reasons at this moment, at the end of his life, this is why he's considered in Hebrews 11 as a man of faith, or he's in the hall of faith, if you will. Listed among all these other men, you look through Samson's account, and you're like, how is he listed next to some of these other men with some of the really poor decisions he made? He's still a man. But this right here shows the faith he had and where he turned to in that moment. And we'll get to that as we go again throughout this text. Now, uh, this is a chart, or this map, I believe, is one that you guys have, have seen as well. No, in fact, I know it is because I stole it off of Harry and Harry and Kurt's PowerPoint, so I know you guys have seen it. But really just kind of showing what we're talking about. You know, we've been going through these different judges, and uh, it's... Uh, a lot of times you might, well, you, you might get the, the thought process, the judge judged all of Israel and went all throughout Israel and all those types of things. But really what we see is judges in these given areas sending in uh, to leave the oppression that is there. Dan, or sorry, Samson from uh, the tribe of Dan is where we are in this lesson. And that really gets into Judges 13. Judges chapter 13, really starting off in verse 1. This goes back to the cycle. But again, what happened? What did people do? They did evil in the sight of the Lord. Because they did evil in the sight of the Lord, what happened? Okay. The oppressors were sent. Who were they in this case? I kind of mentioned it. The Philistines, right? The Philistines were sent. Okay. So that's where this starts. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them to the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Verse 2. Now, there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites. And this is, you know, really, I believe, uh, one of the questions. I'm going to try to use 
some of the book, but number one on fill in the blank, Samson was the son of who? Manoah. Samson was the son of Manoah and of the tribe of Dan. Okay, so the son of Noah from the tribe of Dan. And again, that's why we see in this area right here, and Dan and Zora is right there, kind of where you see Samson's name in the blue line being pointed to. Now, um, so it's talking about this man, Manoah, but where does the account start, right? Is it with Manoah? I mean, I know it mentions him, his, his name, but who appears? An angel of the Lord. Who does he appear to? His wife, right? Interesting. So the angel of the Lord appears to his wife, and what does the angel of the Lord say? I got it up here on the board. All right, she's going to give birth. What do we know about his wife? She was barren, right? She was barren. So this angel of the Lord appears. Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you, can, you shall conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and a razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. So, this child, obviously, a blessing from the Lord. His wife was one that was barren. She is now uh, told that she is going to be one that is going to conceive and bore this child. And he is to be what to the Lord? The Nazarite, right? You can go back into Numbers. Uh, I believe it's number six. You can go back into number six. And he even mentions a few things here of what is not to be done because of that Nazarite vow that is there, right? And those types of things. So we see this, and we see uh, it pointed out to her. Now, what does she do? She has the, or has the angel of the Lord appear to her, and she go, or the, the angel of the Lord leaves. Where does she go? Yeah, it goes to her husband. And I find it uh, very, uh, not necessarily interesting, but encouraging, and I think we can make a point of application of what her husband, who is Manoah, what does he do? She goes to him, a little bit of a conversation, but what does he then do? Praise that the angel will come back. Praise that the angel will come back. Why? He wants to know more about what the child is going to do. That's right. He wants to know more about what the child is going to do. Verse 8, then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, my Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come to us again and teach us what we shall do for the child who will be born. I think it's a very... Uh, applicable point that we can look at whenever we look at somebody who, and, and in this case, you know, we recognize that she was barren. She hadn't had children. They hadn't had children together. And so now that he's going to have this child, and where does he turn to to try to figure out how am I going to raise this child? He turns to the Lord. He turns to the Lord in prayer. And I believe that that is something that we see throughout Scripture that we should be doing, and we see it exemplified here. And we're going to get into chapter 14, and I'm going to try to bring out another point that I believe we see there that's more than just praying for the wisdom or praying for what do I need to do with this child? How do I raise him? What are the things that I need to do, especially with it being a Nazarite? But not only that, making the application and trying to help um, uh, Samson in, in his raising and in his choices and decision making. And so I think it's, it's, a, it's a point of application that we need to look at. Manoah... And or Manoah and his wife, but particularly Manoah with this prayer, shows us the seriousness that we're to take with our children as young parents, praying to God for wisdom and how to raise this child to do the will of the Lord, to be a servant of the Lord. And it's, it's something that we see here, and I think something that we can take and make application of. And not only can we make application of the fact that Manoah is a good example of what to do, but what do we know? Does the angel of the Lord return? Yes, the angel of the Lord does return, right? And we know that God listens to, he cares for us, he hears our prayers. Or, sorry, God does. And so we see the angel of the Lord returning. Now, the angel of the Lord returns, and whenever the angel of the Lord returns, um, what does, and man, I was actually going to try to use some of these questions, but I'm just blazing through it. So the angel of the Lord returns. Um, what are, first of all, does, uh, it, th th does the angel of the Lord return to Manoah? <coughs> no, it goes to his wife again. His wife goes and gets Manoah, and Manoah comes. What are some of the things that Manoah asked? Asked what his name is. Yeah. What would be the manner of the child's life? Yeah, 
what his name is, those types of things. The, the angel of the Lord doesn't, doesn't give that to him, right? Those types of things. And what is hinted at as you work through this? What does Manoah think about this being that's before him? Yeah, I think that that's a conclusion we come to. I mean, he obviously, he, he thinks he's a man, doesn't recognize this, the angel of the Lord, and that's because of really what the image in, uh, shows here as you get to the end of the uh, account here. So the angel of the Lord um, has this conversation with him. Manoah, what does he want to do? Okay, so first he wants to prepare, prepare, prepare the, a meal, right? Get a goat for him and those types of things. And what does the angel of the Lord tell him? He can't. Larry? Well, I'll stay, but I, I won't be able to eat. Okay. You know, so. Yep, stay, not be able to eat. And so what does he say that he can do? Offer a burnt offering to the Lord, right? And then that's what leads to this, right? So he offers this offering to the Lord. This is really number two on the answer. Plainly, uh, plainly, Manoah and his wife did what when the angel of the Lord ascended into heaven? So that question gets ahead of what happened. As the fire and the smoke start going up, what happens? Yep, the angel of the Lord went and ascended in the smoke. And so then what was the reaction of Manoah and his wife? They fell on their faces, right? They fell on their faces, and Manoah has this fear that what's going to happen to them now that they've seen the angel of the Lord? Yeah, they're going to die. But what is said, well, what, what does his wife say? If we were going to die, we're going to be die already. Why would he accept the sacrifice if that was what was meant to happen? Okay? So obviously that doesn't happen. They, at this point, recognize that uh, that was no just man, that that was the angel, of, uh, an angel of the Lord. And as a um, result of that, um, again, they fall on their faces and they worship him. Now, after this, um, the chapter ends in 13 with what? Samson was born. Okay. Yeah, very good. Samson was born and the Lord blessed him. And we see that as we go throughout his life. Um, so in chapter 13, really what, what we get as we work through it is the um, angel Lord visiting Manoah and his wife and telling them that Samson's going to be born. Uh, there is this Nazarite vow that is told to them that, 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 or, you know, that she and the child are going to need to adhere to. And as we go throughout, we're going to see a little bit more of it. Um, does anybody got anything else on this chapter? It's obvious that Samson had good parents. He, he came from a, a background of people who sincerely and genuinely respected God and wanted to do what appeared over and above all things what was right to the Lord. That's right. Samson, I mean, from all that we can tell, appears to have good parents, right? Uh, once Manoah finds out, he prays to the Lord. He offers the sacrifice to the Lord um, and all those types of things. And I think that we see that continued as we get into Judges chapter 14. Okay, And I'll, I'll show that here in a minute what I mean. Now we get into Judges 14. Samson's born. Uh, he's obviously one that's growing. Uh, he's been blessed by God. We get here, and what do we recognize from the start? Where does Samson go to get a wife, if you will. Okay, so it goes to Timna, right? Um, he goes down to Timna, and this is number three of the fill in the blank. Uh, who said of a woman? Samson said a woman where? In Timna, for she pleases me well. So, he goes to Timna, he sees this woman, and she pleases him well. What, what does that mean, she pleases him well? Yeah, he wants her for a while. Okay. Now, what do his parents say? That's right. They're trying to get him to, he's like, they're like, whoa, 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 and I, 
believe uh, Vernon said it, she's a Philistine woman, right? Why would you go get a Philistine woman and not take a wife from our people? I believe that this, again, points to the parents that he had, right? They're just, he's older, he's grown, he can make his own choices, and I believe that that is a very big point of this section of Scripture, the fact that man has free will and the ability to make his own choices, but do his parents just let that happen without saying something? It was God's will that Philistine. And so that's one of the things that we recognize through this. And one of the things that I want to point out about this, so his parents are saying, well, why would you go get a Philistine woman? I mean, that's going to cause a lot of problems. One of the questions that I want to pose to you all is this. It was God's will that the Philistines would be destroyed. But did that mean that God made Samson choose a wife from the Philistine, uh, from the Philistines? So what is that then? How does free will work into that? God used the pagan as a curse. That's exactly right. Did God make Samson choose a wife from a, or a, a foreign wife? Who told the children of Israel not to take foreign women as wives? God. So would God then make Samson do something that was sinful? I believe it goes back to what Clayton said. God used it as an occasion. Who made that choice? Who chose her because it pleased him? What did God use it as? An occasion or an opportunity. In other words, what I'm trying to point out is we need to be very careful whenever we make statements and whenever we look at Scripture and say that God made this happen. God used it to carry out his will. God can use the choices of men. We see that throughout Scripture to carry out his will. Does that mean that God makes men make the choice to sin to then carry out his will? No. He, he uses the choices of men to carry out his will. He used this choice here. Was it a wise choice? No, no it was not a right, wise choice. Was it the right choice for Samson? No. But what could God do? Use it as an occasion. Steve? God knew what, how he would choose, just as he knew Pharaoh would choose part of his heart by giving him an option that he knew he wasn't going to agree with. So that's, that's right. That's right. That God does know That's right. our hearts and how we will choose. That's right. God knows our hearts. God knows how we will choose, right? Does God have the ability to see in the future? I believe Scripture clearly points that out. Does that mean that God makes our choices for us? No, man makes the choices. But God can use it as an occasion. Okay? I want to point that out because that can be tricky and it can trip up. Right? Whenever you come to free will and you're like, wait a minute, it looks like that God made this happen. God has, man has free will. God lets man make choices. And God <laughs> certainly isn't going to make Samson make a choice that would lead him to sin. Samson has the ability to make his own choices. But here in this case, God used it as an opportunity to bring an occasion against the Philistines. Right? DJ? God also does God and see that Samson doesn't avoid consequences from that action either. And there are consequences. That's right. It's one of the things that we see throughout Samson's life, and, and one of the points I think we can take from it. You know, he makes this decision and choice, and God can use it to carry out his will against the Philistine, right, to start to relieve that oppression that is there. Because we know, even at the end of it, that the oppression isn't fully gone with the Philistines. The Philistines continue to be a problem even in the time of David, right? But um, God uses it. Samson still has consequences of that as a result. Steve? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so we see that here with Samson, and I'm, I'm glad Steve brought that in, brought it in with Pharaoh. I believe we see it with Judas as well, right? Did God make Judas uh, betray Christ? No, he did not. That would be against God's uh, sovereignty, right? 
and the ability for man to make the choices, but he used that as an opportunity to bring about his will in the death of Christ. Okay? Anybody else got anything on that before we can continue to move on to Judges 14? Yeah, it's an example to uh, see how important choosing the right mate is, whether it's the right wife or husband. So take your time, choose the right one, don't jump into anything, because I'm going to tease you, your life can be where you think. Yeah, that's right. You know, and we see that throughout Samson's life, we're going to see it again. In 15, some of these choices he makes and the lack of self-control that he has, and uh, that's, that, that, that's a very good point. Um, that we need to consider as we look at Samson throughout his life. Jason, did you have your hand up? No. Okay. I was just talking about oh. listening to your parents when we get to this. <laughs> right. He had the opportunity, his parents warned him, and I think we all probably have been in that situation, especially as teenagers and adolescents, that has the ability to do that, and you should go do it, and you suffer the consequences. And God allowed him to suffer the consequences, too. That's right. That's right, you know, it, and I mean, again, as has been said, I mean, it, everything that we read from Scripture in ways that we've been given, while it's not a ton, his parents seem to be those who are spiritually minded and trying to give good, scriptural, wise advice in this situation. And he essentially says, I really don't care. She pleases me. Go get her, okay? So um, they then, um, and so I brought this uh, chart up just because this is very um, – scoped in to the land of Canaan, really right here into Dan and a little bit of Judah and stuff. Uh, but um, Zora's right there, Timnah's right there, just kind of giving us a point. So they go down to Timnah, or they're on their way to Timnah, and uh, what do they run into? What comes out? Okay, right, a lion. What does he do with the lion? He, yeah, he tears it apart. It's just, just, you know, from what scripture gives us, that just a simple killing the lion, right? Just beating up the lion, strangling it or something. I mean, rips it apart, right? Uh, how does it put it as one would rip apart a young goat, I believe it is, right? And so we see that the strength he is given and he's blessed with from God, okay? And we're going to see this as we continue on. Now, he does that. He throws the carcass <coughs> in the dish, and that's kind of getting ahead a little bit. Uh, get, get, get a little bit further into chapter 14, Um as normally would happen in this time, uh, you would have uh, this kind of a wedding celebration, if you will, or the, the, this type of thing going on. What does Samson say about, well, I guess we need to back up with the lion. I forgot about that. With the lion, as he returns, he goes back by it. What's in it? Bees and honey. And he goes in the carcass. He gets the honey, takes it back, gives it to his uh, mom and dad. Now. We then get to the wedding feast. He has this riddle, right? Uh, Harry? In Judges 14, it's important to remember when he kills the lion, that means he's took the dead body, which was not only against Nazarite vow, it was against uh, the law. You had to then separate and right. do uh, some cleansing that was there. And when he took the honey from the lion, that's really something where you had a problem both by the Nazarite vow and by the law <laughs> itself. Not only did he uh, cause himself to be uh, defiled, right. he caused his parents to be, be defiled and all others that were there with him. Uh, that's a good point. I'm glad you brought that out uh, and, and, and brought, brought that up. We continue to see the choices that Samson's making along the way here, going against God's word and God's law, certainly against the Nazarite vow, but it's more so than just that. Uh, it's something that if the children of Israel were to do that, there was a period of time that was to be set uh, aside um, as a result of that. So um, we see that with Samson. Now we get to the wedding uh, or to the, to, to the celebration, if you will. He has this um, riddle, right? He gives this riddle, and what does um, he do with that? Um, to, to the 30 men, their companions that were there. He gives them the riddle, and what does he say? He said, if you get this, then he'll give them 30 garments of linen and stock with a tent. He, he gets the one garment. Yeah, very good, very good. So 
uh, basically within this period of time, which is how many days? Seven days, right? Within seven days, if you get it, um, then I will give you 30 uh, garments and 30 pieces of linen. If not, you owe it to me, right? What happens? Do they get it? They don't know it. So then what do they do? Jason? You see this here with um, with uh, this Philistine uh, wife. You see it whenever we get to Delilah as well, right? Kind of those influences that you're around and the choices uh, and the path that you end up going down, the decisions or choices that you make. So, um, and, and, and the influence is there. And so, um, you know, they, they certainly use this. They go to her. They threaten her with not only burning her, but I believe her family as well. Uh, and then... She eventually gets it out of him, right? Again, it goes back to influences. You get around those influences, and they're leaning on you and leaning on you, and you're trying to say, no, 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 you're not going to give it. He's not going to give her the riddle in this case. And while just the giving of the riddle, right, giving the answer to the riddle was not necessarily wrong in of itself, we can tell it all in this situation, no doubt how that was used against him marrying a Philistine woman. And she gets that out of them. She goes and she tells um, the men. And what do they do? They tell him. And then what does Samson say? And this is, I believe, one of the either fill in the blanks um, or one of the short answers. Yeah, number four uh, on answer plainly. Why did, uh, sorry, what did Samson say when the men answered his riddle? So what's he essentially saying? Say that again. That they were with his wife. Yep. So they went to his wife and they got this out of her and, you know, all these types of things. He gets pretty angry about that. What does he do? He goes to, uh, I believe it was Ashkelon. I didn't write that one down in my notes, but he goes down to a city. And what does he do? Kills 30 men and takes their garments and stuff, you know. Gets frustrated, gets angry, and goes down, kills 30 men to take their garments and then take back and give to them. Um, Again, we see the path of you make the choice to marry a Philistine woman and what that leads to, right? The choices it leads to, the frustration that it leads to. In other words... You go against God's law, you go against God's word, you act in a way that is not according to God's word. Does it just stop with that one bad decision? What does it usually seem to do? Clearly in this case, leads to another, which leads to more frustration, which leads to other things. Now we know, again, God's using all this as an opportunity to carry it out against the Philistines, but he could have used it in any way. Or he, he, he could have found uh, whatever way possible to be able to do this if Samson would have made the right choices. So Samson continues to go down this path. Not only does he um, find himself here killing this lion and then going against God's word and law there. Then he's using it in this riddle. And all these types of things are starting to show the choices that Samson is making. Samson kills those 30. He, throws, he gives them the clothes. And then he goes away. And then you get to chapter 15, and he comes back, right? What's he trying to do whenever he comes back? Who's he looking for? Yeah, he wants his wife, right? What does her father say? Huh? Oops. (laughs) What what, what had he done? I thought that you hated her. You left. I thought that you hated her, so I gave her to your companions, right? Once again, do we see Samson's choices, and even going back to that of marrying a Philistine wife, and then that leading to frustration and anger and killing these 30 men to give the 30 uh, pieces of garments and 30 pieces of linen, and then going away for a period of time and coming back caused problems in his life. 
I think one of the things that you see throughout Samson is that old adage about sin, right? What does sin do? A lot of times sin is, and I wrote it down somewhere so I wouldn't mess it up too bad, hopefully. Sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you're willing or want to pay, right? That's what sin does. And you get wrapped up in sin, and you keep making these decisions and going down this path, and it causes problems, okay? So he gets back, and he's frustrated about that. What is offered to him? Yeah, her, uh, his, another daughter of his, right? Her sister. And uh, uh, Samson isn't good with that, so then what does that lead to him doing? Goes out, catches how many foxes? 300 of them. What does he do with those 300 foxes? <coughs> yep, ties, tails go, places torches between them, and lets them run through the grain fields, right? Burning the grain fields down. Now he does that, and where does he go after that? Larry? He goes to the rock ruin. Okay, very good. So he goes down to the rock at uh, Edom, and whenever he's there, who then comes looking for him? Who, who, so the Philistines want him, but who actually comes down and gets him? Yeah, very good. Right. So the children of Israel come down, and what do they say? Yeah, they've been impressing us all this time, and what are you doing this for? You know? And his response to that is what? Larry? That's right. Before that, he tells, um, you know, I mean, what, what, what they've done to me, I've done this thing to them, right? And so they're talking to him, like, well, they want you, those types of things. He's like, promise me you won't kill me and you can take me up there, right? So they bind him up and they take him up there, right? And they promise that, yeah, we won't kill you, we'll just take you to him. So they take him to him. There's the conversation, or what's supposed to be depicting the conversation. They tie him up. And whenever they get up there, what do the Philistines do? <laughs> the Philistines do die. I'm looking for something right before that. Go ahead. They shout. They, he's been delivered. they shout, right? They think, well, he's been captured. He's been captured. They've uh, He's been delivered to us, and what does he do with the bonds that have been wrapped around him? Breaks free of it. What does he find? Job on another donkey, and what does he do? Kills a thousand Philistines. You know, you, you look at this, and we obviously know it's, it's very similar to, I believe, when Harry was teaching through Gideon in the 300, right, and the amounts that they killed. You can go back before that, Joshua and the conquering of Canaan. You look at this, and people might say, I mean, really, do you think that can happen? Well, not by the will of man. What's the point? This is God behind this, right? And that's the point that's there behind it. God is behind this. Samson taking the jawbone of the donkey, killing these thousand men with it, and um, go, doing it in that way. Um, and so we see, we see him doing that. Now, we get to the end of Judges 15, and we know that uh, he does this, and the statement's made, how, how long does Samson judge Israel? 20 years, right? 20 years. That then gets us into Judges 16. I'm trying to kind of move along. I know we went through a lot there in 15, uh, but I got some application. I'm going to try to make it end of 16, um, and I don't have a whole lot of time left. So does anybody have anything that they want to point out there? Scott? A lot of this is back to a hot temper with anger and revenge. She just keeps multiplying. That's right. Is this your problem? That's right. You know, and you see that. You know, Harry was talking about some of that this morning, right? Getting angry, getting frustrated, not stopping and thinking and considering things. And we see Samson being somebody who's reactionary. And I believe we see that not only is he reactionary to his anger and frustration, but even, obviously, in picking women and wives. I mean, you get to the beginning of 16, and where does he go? To Gaza. What does he find at Gaza? A harlot, right? He finds a prostitute, and he goes into her, and all these types of things, then more people surround him to try to overtake him whenever he's in the middle of that. Here's one of the things that I'm wanting to point out here, and I'm just, Scott was there. I was going to make it kind of towards the end, but I think that this is a good point to make it. We see this throughout 
Samson's life, not only was he somebody who lacked self-control and anger, he lacked self-control in a bunch of areas of his life. And we have to be in control. And this is in spite of, or despite, we talked about this. He had good parents, right? Everything that we can tell. Do good parents mean that the child is going to grow to be faithful? And just because the parents are good and grounded and founded and teach truth. And, and try to do it in that way, does that mean 100% for sure that the child is going to make the right choice and do the right thing? No. Now, there is way more of an opportunity or way more of, a, of a, the chance that they will. And Scripture talks about that, right? Train up a child in the way that he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. And all those are true. But just because the parents do right, what does the child also have to do? have to decide for themselves to make the right choices and have self-control. And it's something that Samson doesn't have. I heard it kind of put this way when I was looking at something on Samson. He had a lot of what we would maybe consider potential, right? Good parents, blessed child, has a lot of strength, has a lot of good things going for him. But does potential equal proper outcomes? No, potential is nothing if you don't take and make application of God's word in particular in the area of self-control. And I think that that's something that we see here with Samson. Although we are going to end his life with positives, we'll get there. We see a lot of bad choices along the way. So you could choose your whole life be mostly focused on what you wanted to do. That's right. Despite your parents, despite you know, whatever teaching you had about God or whatever, it, it was always about him. That's right. About him. That's right. There's a lot of uh, what he wants to do, what he wants to go out and get, whether it's from his wife to you know how he feels like he should treated, getting angry, frustrated, all those types of things. All right, so I got five minutes. I know I saw hands going up in the corner of my eye, but I'm going to, sorry, ignore them for now. Judges 16, okay? This is the one, you know, we're going to spend the least amount of time on this one. This is one that probably most people are familiar with, right? Starts off there with the harlot down in Gaza, but then we get to Delilah. Where's Delilah from? Where does he, this is Valley of Sort of, right? Very good. So he falls in love with her. Now, who gets when that Samson is falling in love or has fallen in love with Delilah? Philistine. Philistine. So what do they do? They come to her. What do they offer? A lot of money, right? 1,100 pieces of silver? Each. 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 Pete, huh? They were each going to give her that. Right. Money. Okay, very good. So. They offer that to her, um, and what does she do? She starts to work on them, right? right? If you really love me, tell me what your strength or what, what, what your weakness is. How many times does she go through saying that, and he gives her the wrong, uh, tells her what uh, isn't a weakness, if you will? Three times, right? And then after that, she says, you know, once again, do you not love me? Those types of things. Once again, we see that continuing um, you know, pushing and pressing on somebody, right? And he gives in on that one. Now, he tells her, so what does she do? She goes and tells them. They come in after she uh, blows them to sleep. Does she cut off his hair? No, somebody else does. She wakes up. The Philistines capture him. What do they do after they capture him? They put out his eyes, okay? And then what does it say they do? So they Capture him, they put out his eyes, and he becomes a what of theirs? Right, right, so he's treasure, he's grinding them. Okay, very good, grinding mill. So, we see that. Now you get to the end of Judges 16. And they're having this big celebration. What's going on in the temple? Who are they celebrating? Dagon, right? Dagon, we've captured Samson, we're, we're having this feast of Dagon, and so they call for Samson, they bring Samson in. Samson asked to be leaned up against two of the pillars. What does he do? He pushes him down and pulls him down, and that's where the statement is made. And this goes back to what I was pointing out at the beginning with Samson. In 28 through 30, Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God, that I may, with one blow, take vengeance on the Philistines. And then we see that he does that. Who does he kill? Everybody there, but what is said about it? How many people? More than his 
more than he earned his life. And you think about what he had done throughout his life, right? And those that he killed with the jawbone and, and other incidences. So he goes out in this way. And I believe this is why we look at Hebrews 11, we look at 32 through 34. This is after the Hebrew writer has gone through and talked about all these different men of faith and what they've done. And he says, and what more shall I say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, and Samson, and Jephthah, and also David, Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued king, work righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, so on and so forth. We recognize that Samson is still considered a man of faith. And so what's the point of application that we can make? Because we look at Samson, and we just spent basically the entire class talking about the poor decisions he made. How is he still listed here? He repented and saw his weakness and knew that without turning that over to God, requesting that strength from God, he didn't have it. That's right. What I want to leave with is this. I know that light just flashed. Hold on. Okay. I want to leave with this. There's times where we can get into our life where we get in a situation like Samson was. Maybe through our own choices. Maybe it's not through our own choices, just time and chance. But certainly with Samson, where he found himself, the choices he made in his life that lead up to that point. He's supposed to be to deliver the Philistines. Yet he finds himself captured with his eyes put out. Right? A lot of times when we get to that point in our life, we think about the choices and decisions that we've made. We're too far gone and we're too, in too dire of a situation to turn back to God. Samson is an example, if you can. Although you've had a life and you've made a lot of poor choices up until this point, does that stop you from making the right choices and proper choices moving forward? From this point moving forward, while there's consequences, especially earthly consequences, to your choices that you've made in the past, there's nothing stopping you from making the right choice and doing the right thing moving forward. And that's something I think that we can all take and make application of, because we sometimes might get there in our life. We've made bad choices. We've put ourselves in bad situations. What now? Turn to God. That's what Samson did. And as a result of that, he's listed as a man of faith. All right. Thanks, guys. We will be on uh, Lesson 12. I believe that's 20 or uh, look at it right now, 17 through 19. 17 through 19 on Wednesday.